2021. This session is case sales 25, 25th anniversary special lecture one session. Uh, I'm Hyung Woo Kim, who working for uh, some national university, uh, Bundan Hospital. Uh, we'll moderate this session. In this session, we have very special and valuable speaker, uh, Dr. Nathan Jundel, although he is not necessarily to introduce him, but I will uh, briefly his professional, introduce briefly his professional career. Uh, he is a clinical professor of the surgery at the Department of Surgery, University at Buffalo and consultant for minimally invasive and bariatric surgery of foundation uh, program in Santa Fe de Bogota. Bogota. And he's a founder, active uh, honorary member of the many surgical laparoscopic and bariatric uh, society. And, and now he's a uh, uh, current IPSES president. Uh, the title of his talk Today is the present future for amazing bariatric and metabolic intervention is right. Please streaming BOD. Hello everyone, it's a pleasure to be with you guys in your meeting, the Korean Society, one I'm very friend to. I congratulate you again for your 25th anniversary. And uh, thank you for the invitation. As president of FIFSIS and myself, it's an honor to be here with you guys. So I'm going to share my screen. So I've been asked to discuss how bright is the future for new bariatric and metabolic interventions. And I'm convinced it's very bright. And I will tell you why. This is the disclosure of companies that I have some relation. But also I want to tell you about the disclaimer because some of what I'm going to present today is not ready for use. Some is used for the different thing it was designed for. So I want you to understand that. When we look at the technology that we have today in a couple of years, it's going to look like this. What we have is good, but it's not perfect. But, but we do very good things with what we have. It's not perfect, but we're going to do good things with what we have. Three important things. First one, safety is the most important thing. No, and real safety, safety. And these two videos will show you also two characteristics that for me the new devices and procedures should have. First one, it cannot be fake. It can be a real one. It's something that change our field, change bariatric and metabolic intervention. But second, what some people are doing is taking what we did by surgery and laparoscopy and now make it by endoscopy. If it didn't work with surgery, it's not going to work by endoscopy. So we don't have to circle and come back to things that they don't work. When we met uh, a couple of years ago with the American Society of Gastroenterology and we developed the American Bariatric Endoscopy Group, we decide to divide the, divide the procedures in stomach and small bowel. And then we notice very clearly that whatever we do in the stomach is more for weight loss. And what we do in the small bowel is much more metabolic. Interventions in the stomach are many. We're going to discuss some of those ones. The classic one, of course, the intragastric balloon, fill of liquid is the classic. And we published this in 2017. And what we notice is now that we have balloons that last a year, we don't need more volumes. Having 500, 600 is enough. But if they can last longer, like for a year, and don't be removed for six months, the results can be better. So the balloons are doing relatively well, but what it changed a little bit more is this. is the swallowable balloon. Because you don't need endoscopy for this, number one. And second, a, a patient can swallow the balloon, it can inflate, it goes with less volume so the patient can have one, then they can have another one in a couple of weeks, and a third one in a couple of weeks, and some of the new balloons, they can be eliminated and degraded by themselves, so you don't need endoscopy to place them and to remove them. The results are not that good, but patients love 
this concept. The other device that is not very popular anymore is the famous Aspire, where you put a gastrostomy tube and then you connect it to this valve. So the patient eats. After the patient eats, he put fluid inside the stomach, he blend the food, and then with the pump, he aspirate and remove the food. It's like a control bulimia by gastrostomy. And that concept is the one that they, they, some people don't like at all. But the results were not bad. The results were not bad. People move more to this. People more move to suturing. There are many different suturing devices that can collapse the wall of the stomach, especially the greater curvature, the anterior and posterior walls, and create kind of accordion figure, then collapse and reduce the size of the stomach, as you can see here. This is a volumetric study. You have your stomach. You measure how big is the volume. Then you do the procedure. And then you notice how the volume reduces. And we thought it only caused restriction. But thanks to some paper that they were done in the Mayo Clinic, we know that the retention in the stomach is very high. You can see here in the publication for Abu Dhabi from Mayo Clinic, when you didn't have the sleeve gastroplasty and when you have it by scintigraphy, the, the gastric retention is much, much higher. So the patient feels full for a longer time. Most importantly, as you can see here, everybody can standardize the procedure very soon. This is done in five different parts of the world simultaneously, and they don't look alike. So standardization is possible. In the US, we started a trial three years ago. We almost finished the pandemic. Uh, delay a little bit the procedure, but we did a cross study. Some of the best hospitals in the country are involved there, 200 patients, some placebo, some the procedure, and now we're finalizing the crossover, and then you're going to see the results pretty soon. But in the meantime, some other groups are designing some other suturing devices, cheaper and less expensive, and that's going to help a lot. So some devices that they are cheaper will allow you to suture the same way, and that will make it much easier. And Domina is the one I just showed you. They showed their first result at six months, and the weight loss is still pretty good. Uh, I even not been that aggressive like the endo suture that I showed you before. As you can see here, total body weight loss of 11 at six months is pretty good. Maybe this is going to change the future a little bit. This is called Endosip. I don't have no relation with this company. But look what it does. You introduce the device, you suck the, the, the stomach inside, and then you pass a suture. One suture, like you're going to see in this video. You suck the stomach, then with one suture that is going around and around and around, you collapse the whole stomach. It's gonna be in one shape, and this is not gonna take you more than five, 10 minutes, and it's gonna make it cheaper. So we are waiting for those results, and it's gonna be pretty good. When we did the gastroplastic, I've been asked all the time if you can convert to a sleeve or a bypass, and we published this, uh, uh, three big groups, as you can see in the first image, is how you see by laparoscopy the endoscopic gastroplasty. Second, you have the endoscopic view when you see that some of the sutures are gone. And in the third one, you see we are converting the suture gastroplasty to a sleeve because the patient regained weight. In my mind, being a chronic disease, we're gonna do something endoscopic and then we're gonna move to surgery if needed. But this is to show you can convert those patients. When you go to the bowel, basically we learn from surgery that if we avoid food going to the first meter, meter and a half of the small intestine, the results, the metabolic results are pretty good. So there are some groups doing a, like big uh, tubes that prevent the food to enter to be in contact with the microvilla of the duodenum. And that has been helping a lot for diabetes. Other groups, what they're doing is they're burning the mucosa to ablate the duodenal mucosa. 
and that has been pretty, pretty good for them. For example, you can see here, this is called fractile. I don't have relation with fractile either. You go to the small intestine, to the duodenum, you lift the mucosa, then you burn it with boiling water, and then it necrosis. And when you follow this patient at three months, they start to recover themselves. This is a video for the first work we did in, uh, in Brazil. So you can see you are with endoscopy, fluoroscopy, we're lifting the mucosa, you burn it. And then this is how you see necrosis immediately. And then those patients start to have very, very good control of the glucose. And when you come back one year later, this come back already. So the plan is redo this again after a year. Because amazingly, look at the results with the mucosa. You see the red one is the baseline. The blue one is what happened with glucose, the Delta PPG, the AUC after one month uh, with the procedure. But more important, look what happened with the hemoglobin A1C and the HOMA IR. And this we're talking at 12 weeks. Look, the results are pretty good. We moved from 8.5 to less than 7 or around 7, and from 5.8 to a, a little bit around 3.5. But what is important, then we went to see what happened with the liver, what happened with NASH, what happened with the infiltration of the fat in the liver. And as you can see here, some of the uh, liver function tests became very, very much better. And when we did this, and this is very important, MRIs, the one you see in the baseline, the more yellow, the more light blue that you see, the more fat. Look how it looks 12 weeks later, much concentrated blue and much less yellow. That means that most of the fatty content of the liver is gone. That's why it helps a lot for metabolic procedures. But some people are working in something different to do the same, laser. So this is a group from Israel. They use laser, they target the submucosa, so you don't need to burn the whole mucosa. They, do. They, they target the submucosa, and you can do it as many times as you want. They present the first paper, follow up at six months, and the results show hemoglobin A1C went from 9.4 to 8.4. The result is not as good as the burning of the mucosa, but the complication for sure is gonna be less. What is gonna replace this? Pills, this pill, this is called Lucy. Lucy is a study that people are doing in Harvard. It's luminal coating. You drink a pill, it will create a coating in the first meter of the duodenum. And then when the patient eats, there is no absorption of food. Then you need to take these pills every eight hours and every 12 hours, depends the pill. And then, then you, you treat diabetes with pills, but no metamorphine but Lucy and some other stuff like this one. This is approved already by the FDA, it's called Glycent. It's a capsule you take before surgery, it will dissolve, will create a coating, and the results in insulin, hemoglobin are very good, suggesting that it will help prevent the absorption of those ones. Other thing we are working a lot, when you see the numbers of the American Society of Bariatric Surgery, the one who's been increasing like crazy is revisions. We are now today more than 16% of cases are revisions. The most common, yes, are sleeve to bypass, but also when the bypass fail, there's not much we can do for this patient. So when they regain weight, this is something we do. We reduce the size of the anastomosis, in this case with argon beam coagulator, you need to do two, three sessions, the complication can be high. So some of us, what we do is suture too, but there are groups working in this. You have a dilated pouch, you have a big anastomosis, you're regaining weight. So why don't we use like a big stent without fixation, it's big in the outside, small in the inside, and then you have a tube that will prevent again absorption. So this, you don't need to go back to surgery, you suture, and then you treat the patients. Other thing that is changing a lot are magnetic anastomosis. 
And I have a very good thing about these ones. You have octagons, magnets, that in the past we tried to put by the mouth and by colonoscopy and then make them couple. And they will couple. And then when you control the by fluoroscopy and by endoscopy, you make them couple very well. And then this is what happened. You deploy them. At the day four, they necrose and connect. And as you can see, day four, 12, and six months later, the anastomosis is still big. No bleeding, no leaks, no complications. So you can see here how the magnet is deployed. You can see the view from laparoscopy. And it's a very safe anastomosis, but you cannot place it where you want. So what we're doing now is using the same concept of magnets for gallbladders and magnets for repair. We are now planning to move the magnets by laparoscopy. So we're going to do endoscopy for placing the magnet and laparoscopy without opening the intestine to couple them. Then I can put the magnets wherever I want. Next and last thing will be endorobotics. I think endorobotics has a big, big room, even much more than robotics. There are many systems now. This is just one. As you can see, there are many ways you can triangulate a little bit. Uh, they need some more strength. But there's some study doing my laparoscopy, endoscopic. And they've been working nowhere. They've been working very well. We are in early stages, but I know at least five companies working a lot in doing robotic endoscopy and robotic colonoscopy. So we're going to see so this. What do you do this is an example. You can see here how the robot is doing a dissection and resection in the colon. And then what is more amazing, after you resect, and you can go full length, you can go through all the layers, and then you're going to use this to suture. And that's what is interesting. You can use this to suture. It's much easier to suture with this robot. And this is going to be the big next move for a endoscopic intervention, robotic endoscopy. So for me, in conclusion of this talk, what I see bright as long as we keep some safety. First one, primum non nocere, do not harm your patients. So we don't go and do everything that they gave us. We, the first time they give us a new device, we go and try it. No, we go slow. We study them in the lab. And then when we're happy, we go in very strict, secure protocols, trials, to try them and see how they go. Second, this is a dog that thinks that he's Batman. Every time we present these surgeons, specifically bariatric surgeons, tell us, but this is not like surgery. This is not better than my sleeve. This is not better than my saris. This is not better than my bypass. Of course, it's not. We need to give the position to these endoscopic and metabolic interventions. Being obesity, a chronic disease, we're going to need with time multiple interventions. So i rather start in the obese, um, low BMIs, with endoscopic interventions. And then some of them don't need anything else. Some will need more. Then you can move to another endoscopic and medication treatment. We have some medi better medications now. And then if it doesn't work for some, those one ended up in surgery, but not everybody, because surgery also fails. And once you fail a big operation, you don't have much to do. So I think we need to understand that. And the last question I get very often is, who's going to be doing this? The bariatric surgeons or the gastroenterologist? Th this is my answer to that question.
whoever does it better. I don't care if it's done by the surgeon, the bariatric surgeon, the gastroenterologist, as long as you do it properly. Word of caution, of course. If you are a, a surgeon or an endoscopist who are not involved with a bariatric multidisciplinary group, you need to be involved because it's not just the procedure. It's not just placing the device or doing the procedure. So bariatric surgeon, they already have multidisciplinary groups. So if you are a general surgeon who wants to do this, or you are a gastroenterologist that want to go on depth in bariatric endoscopy, what you have to do is mix with a multidisciplinary group. This way, we're gonna reach much more people in need early. And even we have remissions, we gonna do more and more easy, less invasive interventions. I want to thank you again for the invitation and I hope to see you soon. Thank you, Dr. Junel. You are very inspired lectures. Uh, even uh, in your country, the time is midnight. Uh, thank you for uh, present in the Q&A session. Uh, uh, your innovative uh, bariatric procedure, especially intervention procedures, uh, some procedures uh, at the volume reduction endoscopic suture. It is uh, kind of the mucosa to mucosa anastomosis. So uh, I wonder if it works or after six months, what, one year, the leak canalization because it's the mucosa, mucosa uh, anastomosis. And also NDOG, uh, there is no room to bend. Uh, I mean, the, the laminar cavity, a, uh, secretion drainage uh, exit is not exist. Yeah, well, thank you very much again for the invitation and I'm, I'm happy to be here. Uh, I will say that uh, a long time ago, we understand that obesity is a chronic disease. So when you have diabetes or hypertension, hypertension is the best example. You start with diet, no salt, then you move to diuretics, and then you move to calcium channel blockers. So you keep advancing as the disease advances. I think bariatric is the same thing. So you start with diet and alimentary behavior changes, and then you move to maybe balloons, suturing, uh, some endoscopic interventions with medications. And that will work for 30% of the people, 35% of the people. And then for the other ones, you're going to need either another endoscopic intervention or surgery. But every year you gain the morbidity and the problem that obesity brings will be delayed. So if you see obesity as a chronic disease, all these interventions will help us with the patient. One of the problem is cost. Who's gonna pay for all this? I understand that. But in a imaginary world where you don't have to pay, this will be the perfect world. You start with medication, endoscopic intervention, you mix them, and then the patients who doesn't work, you move to something more aggressive like surgery. Because even surgery fails with time. Some of the surgeries will fail. So if you go that step by step, it will be better. And then also, when surgery fail, your interventions can be endoscopic. You don't have to go back to surgery again. You cannot stent like we presented. You cannot suturing. You can add some devices, and then they all complement. They will all work together for the patients. Thank you. Thank you very much. And in this session, many uh, international residents and many young uh, bariatric surgeons may be involved in these sessions. Any uh, special word to encourage them? Yes. Yeah. The first one, make sure that in your training or in your studies after surgery, you need to learn endoscopy. I think surgeons today without endoscopy, they're gonna lose half of their work. Like uh, 
the vascular surgeon looks at with radiologists, we have to do endoscopy. So we have to do not only diagnostic endoscopy, what we need to learn to suture, to put stents, to put devices. And then bariatric surgery will be for us. If we don't do endoscopy, we ended up just say, doing surgery for complications. So I think we need to encourage them to learn endoscopy. Yes. And robotics, you saw robotics. <laughs> I, I think I think endoscopic robotics are better than laparoscopic robotics. So I see the future in endoscopic robotics a lot. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you again. And uh, uh, I, I'm not a bariatric surgeon, but I uh, work for uh, Catholic cancer uh, field uh, more than 25 years. But as you mentioned, when I was young, uh, we had no time to, to do endoscopy. But the, these days, yes, all the uh, young surgeons, yes, yes. I totally agree with your uh, comment. Thank you, Dr. Jundel, again. And yes, have a and good sleep. Congratulations. Sleep. Congratulations for your anniversary. That's a big step. 25 years is a lot. Yo. So congratulations. And thanks for the invitation again. Thank Hope you. To see thank you. Hope to see you soon. Yeah, okay, okay. Thank you very much. I will close this session. Thank you. Thank you very much.